So we're going to spend the next 50 minutes or so talking about what Dan Matter BB is um, and, and how do we see it. I'm going to try to explain kind of how we got to this notion that dark matter is out there. So I'm going to take a bit of the beginning to slow down, and then I'm going to give an example uh, of how we built state of the art dark matter detector. But keep in mind that there are many different ways to look for dark matter and dark matter. The path that I'm showing you is just one of them. It just happens to be the one closest to my chest. Uh, you see also that there might be some overlap, especially in images when we study the universe with the previous talk, even though it's about black holes, uh, this is about dark matter. But ultimately, we're here to answer the same question, which is we try to understand what is the true nature of the universe around us. That's what we're trying to do. So if you see similarities, it's because ultimately we're driven by the same question. Uh, so, so that's it. So in order to answer this question, we kind of have to understand where we are today, what's the story so far. And the way I conceptualize it is that I would have to ask myself two more questions in order to do that, which is do we understand the status of matter, what matter is? Do we understand what energy of matter is in our universe? And most importantly, do we understand how the universe evolved, meaning that this snapshot of perception of what mass and energy is, is that true for the lifespan of the universe? And we understand how that progress. And if we can answer those two questions and we can put, put together a clear picture, we can then go back and stare into the universe and see if, if we can describe it all. So let's start with the first one. Do we understand matter? To do that, let's take a quick walk across the whole scale of the universe, from the most fundamental component to the largest portions, uh, to, the to the edges of the universe itself. Let's start there for, for, for scale at the human perception. <laughs> so that's something, say, this is a scale of the meters. Um, and say for human perception, say the smallest thing you can see, maybe a human head, if you have poor vision like mine, uh, that's in the order of micrometers. So that's about what, 100,000 smaller than a meter. Uh, so you're sitting somewhere over here, 10 to the minus five. If you look up in the sky, you might see something pretty big, like the sun or the moon, uh, that goes to maybe 10 to the five. Um, but you can look at something even more mundane, things like a desk or things that we can grab on. Say for me, I spend an awful amount of time pounding this ball on the floor. Um, so say you start with a basketball and you ask yourself the question, what is a basketball made of? Turns out that if you go to ChatGPT and you ask that question, ChatGPT will tell you it's all made of chemicals and chemicals are some of your elements. We understand that really well, we map that out, we have a certain range of elements in the universe that we see both at stars and theorems. Uh, but that's not it, right? So you can go down a few other magnitudes and you get into this sort of elements, but elements are not the fundamental for fundamental. So what are elements made of? It turns out that every element has an atomic structure. So we see this combination of what we call, um, if we go down another maybe 10 order of magnitudes, we see this combination of, of what we call nucleus and electrons moving around. These are what, those are our elementary particles and they behave much like planets do in a sense. There's a lot of something really heavy in the center and then there's something really light moving around it that follows some sort of physics group. And we can map out the difference in atomic structure for each of these elements uh, fairly precisely. And so uh, some of these are what we call elementary particles, meaning there are infinitesimal instances of energy and mass that forms the absolute basics of our universe. Kind of think of it as Lego blocks of our universe. There's nothing smaller than that. But for some of them in this case, for instance, if you take an atom, the nucleus itself is made of protons and neutrons. It's not really fundamental. There's something deeper than that. We build, if we go and probe even further inside this nucleus, there are what we call quarks, you know, maybe up and down. So ultimately, we can keep going and study further and further to 10 to the minus 30 meters or so. And we see this fundamental nature of the universe that builds into these infinitesimally small instances of matter uh, that we call subatomic particles. And the universe can be broken down to those at any scale. So we started as a basketball, uh, but you can really go out, keep going up that scale if you want to, and describe it all back to elementary particles. We know that if you look up in the sky, as we've seen before, you see stars and planets, and they orbit around each other to some degree. But that's not it, right? We can keep going. We know that each planet and 
And stars are made of elements. Elements are made of atoms. Atoms are made of elementary particles. Uh, but that's not it, right? So, so stars and, and planets congregate right together to form galaxies much softer than not. So you see these things like this image of what Earth, Earth galaxy looks like, the Milky Way. And so sometimes you have these nice, beautiful spiral arms where all of the mass, most of the mass sits in the center. And then as the galaxy turns, the light is scattered. Right? But that's not it either, right? So we can keep going again. This is all made of stars and planets, and planets are made of atoms and so on. But we can keep going even into largest clusters. So this is an image um, of, of the Coma cluster, which is a, a collection of galaxies. Uh, so each of these uh, bright points is a galaxy. It contains, let's say, you know, a galaxy contains something on the order of what, 200 million, a billion stars, say it's on an average size. So some might contain more, some might contain less. So, you know, if the visible sky contains what, one trillion, trillions of, uh, of, of stars. So all of this can be broken down back to elementary parts. So we took quite a journey, but I want to, for those of you who maybe are not super familiar with, you know, this, this span of 60 order of magnitudes, maybe order of magnitudes, is, it's not really something that you can conceptualize. So let me maybe take a, a quick step to put things in perspective. If we were to look at the size of the electron, this fundamental particle that actually you know very well because electricity is actually it's just a flow of a multiplicity of electrons combined together. They function almost like a, a water streaming into your electronic devices. <clears throat> but if you were to compare the size of the electron to the size of an atom that this electron is orbiting around or in it, it would be like comparing the size of a basketball to the size of the sun. That puts things in perspective of when we talk about subatomic particles, we're talking about really, really small building blocks of the universe. I can keep talking in front of you. Uh, <clears throat> so we took this crazy walk from where we are to subatomic particles and all the way to the largest formations in the universe. Uh, but, and I'm going to keep making this point and this point and this point. Everything collapses to elementary particles. Everything boils down to elementary particles. So if we understand the nature of those, in principle, we should be able to, to describe how matters evolves across the entirety of the universe. And it turns out the scientists have really dedicated the last hundred years to nail this down. And so we put together the beautiful symmetry that we call the standard model of particle physics. So if you look at it, this nice picturesque representation that almost looks like random letter put together by an elementary school student, they're actually, each one of those are the totality of elementary particles that combine together to make the universe that we see today. It boils down to something this simple. Everything from the largest pushes in the cosmos to planets to basketball, it all boils down to a combination of these random letters. Each of one represents a subatomic particle. And this theory that we put together, the standard model, which I think is actually one of the greatest success in, science, in modern science. It took us 100 years to discover each and every one of these particles. But most importantly, not only have we discovered this part, but we can model how they communicate with each other. We can model how they exchange energy with each other and how they form the matter that we do, extremely precise. If we want to get technical for a moment, I'm sorry if I'm losing a few of you, we can look at some of the results from the LHC. This is the Large Hadron Collider, one of the biggest experiments on the planet. This is a result from the Atlas detector that a lot of my colleagues here try and work on. And what you see here is just a, what we call a graph, because mostly scientists like to find ways to represent the math that they calculate into something that you can see. Uh, but don't be scared of this. It's just really just a visual representation as much as this is. And what you have is that the y-axis represents what we call cross-section, which is really, think about it as how often each instance of these standard models of atomic particles communicate with each other. And on the x-axis, you have all the different combinations of this manifestation of the standard model. So you can kind of think of it as the different ways that this language can unfold. And what we have in each of these single points is the gray is the theory. The gray represents the standard model of particle physics. And this extremely large experiment, the Atlas experiment, larger than collider, went on. And for each combination of this subatomic particle, we didn't measure 
their, 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 their probability rate, so how often they would manifest itself. And what you can see is that all the measurements are spot on on the theory. So not only we are capable of reconstructing the building blocks pictures of the universe, so these handful of subatomic particles that make up everything, but we can describe how they communicate and how they exchange mass and energy to an absolute infinitesimal precision. In fact, we literally gave thousands of the smartest people on the planet, almost, a, okay, some people might get upset, but almost a limited budget to stress test this theory and all they're doing is just fine tuning it and fine tuning it, which is a thing of beauty, really. Um, it absolutely is incredible what they have achieved. So that's where we are with matter. We understand how everything collapses down to subatomic particles. We spent a hundred years, got a handful of Nobel Prizes to understand this theory that describes how everything communicates. So is this just an individual snapshot or do we understand how everything evolves as well? And how do we, though we study the evolution of the universe is we, we actually build telescopes as we've seen in the previous talk. This is an example with the Darwin map, but most recently the Glund telescope did the same. And we take advantage of the fact that we can put this telescope up in outer space and we can get them to stare up into the universe by literally mapping the sky. And we take advantage of the fact, as been pointed out in the previous talk, that it takes a long time for light to travel. So if you can build a telescope that can further and further distance into it, because it takes time for light to travel, what you're actually imaging is a picture of that component really backwards in time, kind of scale by how long it takes light to travel. So in a way, by putting this telescope up in, sp in space and staring back into the universe, we're actually looking backwards in time and imaging what was very close to the early stages of the universe. And by doing that, we put together this clear picture. The universe started with a big bang, so a big explosion that drove matter across and the fast expansion and then eventually the universe flattened out, although it's still expanding, just not at, at the rate that it did at the very beginning. What does after a current time we have, most, not speculative, but we can only predict. We have a few ideas of where the universe is going, um, but that's a topic for another conversation. Uh, what's really good about this is that by making this map, not only we can trace how the universe evolved and create a clear picture where we are today, but we can actually measure the remnants of the explosion that spawned us all. So this, this satellite is capable of reproducing what we call the cosmic micro measuring, what we call the cosmic microwave background. In the random radiation of the Big Bang itself. Imagine kind of like if there is, that's a very ominous uh, announcement, but if you see a, a video of the atomic bomb, there's this big mushroom-like cloud that comes with it you know that there is a terrible sound that comes with it. And similar, the, the, the Big Bang has, has an explosion as sort of measurables to it. We can see the effects and the temperature scales of the universe. We can kind of hear the explosion if we measure it, right? And we got really good at mapping this. I just wanted to show that, that those telescopes, this is a, those telescopes that look back in time right at the beginning. And this is a picture of the map, this is a map of the sky. So this is all the visible universe that we can put our eyes on. By putting your eyes on, I mean, this is where the telescopes can look. And we got in the last, oh, geez, in the last 30 years, wow, I'm starting to get pretty old. Uh, in, in the last 30 years, we're getting really, really, um, really, really good at mapping this remnant radiation from the Big Bang. So in other ways, we're getting infinitesimally precise, good, and measuring what the force of the Big Bang was. And keep this in mind, because it will become crucial when we talk about dark matter phase. So we now know what matter is. We kind of understood roughly at every scale. We kind of went back and we, let's say for lack of argument, that we all agree that fundamental particles are the building blocks. We know how the universe evolved and we can measure that as well. So the question that you should be asking yourself now is are we missing anything? If you do that now, you can patch those two information together and go back and look at the sky and see if you can make sense of it. The first person to really go through this exercise was Dr. Fritz Zwicky uh, from Caltech. Um, let's just take a rather unique character and just leave it at that. Um, he, he spawned the field, so we have to mention it, but he was a rather harsh man, I'd say. 
Um, nevertheless, what, what he did was, was quite smart. He took a big telescope, you can see an image here of Caltech, and pointed towards the coma cluster, which is this image that you're seeing right here from uh, taken from the Hubble telescope. The coma cluster is a group of uh, is a cluster of different galaxies that came together. Some of them smash actually together some, and, and form new galaxies, and some of them instead just nearby influencing each other's uh, potential orbits. And he did something interesting. So he first looked at how bright those galaxy were. And he said, okay, the energy of that galaxy should be, you know, scaled by how bright that is. And then he looked at how fast that galaxy were, was moving with respect to the cluster and estimated the same amount of energy for the, and estimated the energy again for the same galaxy using its velocity. And in principle, if, if everything that we know and understand about matter were to be true, the measurement for light and the measurement for velocity should be equal. The two energy calculations should be the same. But it turns out that there was a big discrepancy. What we could measure by measuring the velocity of the galaxies was 50 times bigger than what we can measure with light. And so he concluded that the vast majority of the universe that is there, so he concluded that there's a lot of mass there, you just can't see it because it doesn't interact with light. And therefore, your telescope cannot perceive it. Um, and, 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 and he coined the dark matter simply because it doesn't interact with light. There was no other reason that he referred to it as dark matter. And then the term stuck. But it was really the first evidence that when we look at pictures like this in the sky, we can only see a very tiny component of this mass content. However, the real nail in the coffin came in the 70s when Dr. Rivera Rubin. Um, started pointing her telescope not at large patches of the sky, but instead focusing on individual galaxies, like the Andromeda galaxy that you can see an image of. What Dr. Rubin did, which you could argue is deserving of a Nobel Prize, mm -hmm. um, is she measured the velocity of each star inside the Andromeda galaxy and reported it as a function of distance from the center. In spiral galaxy, most of the mass is right at the center, and very little is in this branching arms, the spiraling around. So just by mass content, we know that from standard physics, from Newtonian physics, uh, those stars uh, should have velocity increase as you uh, leaving the disk, and as you're leaving the disk, it's just sort of died off because you just no longer have enough enough matter in here to sustain that velocity. Mm -hmm. But what Vera Rubin measured instead was that the speed of galaxy goes up. And then it sort of continues to grow slash flattens out across the galaxy. And that was really unexplained. <clears throat> she instead theorized that, together with a bunch of other uh, theories, that what happens is that there is a halo of what we call dark matter. So there's matter in there. You just can't see it with your telescope. But the matter instance is there. And that's matter, this dark halo matter, is really what is giving enough mass to those stars to, to, to go around the galaxy at such speed. This was really a, a case of unmistakable evidence from a cosmological point of view. If we look at the large scales of the universe, dark matter is out there, there's no question. Mm -hmm. However, the most compelling evidence comes for, for the presence of dark matter in the universe, comes from when we go back and look at the cosmic microwave background. As I mentioned before, this remnant radiation of the Big Bang is what effectively kickstarts all the matter and all the components of the universe to expand. And therefore, it has a feature, it has a power spectrum, which is kind of, think, you can kind of think of it as, it has a sound to it. You can listen to that explosion. And it turns out that that sound, that power spectrum, <laughs> that's a unique shape that tells us exactly, very precisely what the composition of the universe is. The relative height between these peaks in the power spectrum, so in this uh, kind of explosion sound of the Big Bang, tell us exactly what the different components of the universe are. Here's an example of if we change one of the cosmological constant, you can see that these peaks and the shape of this, of this power spectrum changes quite drastically. So by, by measuring this, we can have a unique imprint of what the energy content of the universe is. And from there, we can extrapolate this. That matter, every, sorry, let me start again. Everything that I showed you that we understand through an infinitesimal precision about the standard model, something that we have built, that we spent billions of dollars to study, something that enables us to describe how black holes function, something that enables us 
to study neutron stars simply only makes up for about 5% of the mass energy content of the universe, 5%. That matter, on the other hand, makes up for about 27% of the universe. Mm -hmm. When I saw these pie charts in the undergraduate, I was like, that's what I have to study. Um, maybe I shouldn't have seen this pie chart. <laughs> So something is missing indeed. So if we step back into the sky with the knowledge of physics that we have today, we simply cannot explain every aspect of it. Something is missing. And, and, and the nature of dark matter is probably one of the most fundamental puzzles when we stare back at the universe. So now natural questions. What is the nature of dark matter? So far, I've shown you that, you know, we think, you know, the universe can be boiled down to tiny little particles, tiny little Lego blocks that are infinitesimal in size, but they carry a lot of energy and mass. And, but I show you that dark matter just makes a big difference at the cosmological scale, as in galaxies and galaxy clusters. How does that relate back to it? Well, we actually believe dark matter functions exactly like regular matter in the sense that it ultimately has a fundamental particle nature to it. So the same way that we have electrons, that we have quarks, that we have neutrinos, that we have the Higgs boson, there's a similar composite for that matter. We just need to understand it. We need to understand what composite, what are the units, how they communicate with each other, and if possible, how does that communicate with regular matter too? But we believe it's, it's particle in nature. Here's some example of what my dearest colleagues came out with in terms of names. And there's a nice picture from the Symmetry magazine, by the way. Mm. If you ever want to read something fun, check out Symmetry magazine. Really awesome. And let me explain to you, perhaps, with one example, why we believe it's fundamentally particle in nature. We go back and stare back to the sky. This is a picture that you've seen before in the previous talk from the James Webb telescopes. So we have now this absolutely fancy telescope that enables us to look back into the sky and stare at all these galaxies and asteroids. Another way to look at it is that this is enabling us to map out the density and cluster structures of the universe, how galaxies and how all these objects are distributed across our visible universe. And we can do that really precisely. As I said, this is a picture that you've seen before. Apologies for providing some, some, some uh, similar images, although I guess I did a uh, different math there. Um, the, 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 the telescope enables us to see galaxy formation almost all the way back to the very beginning of time. This is 650 million years after the Big Bang. For, for reference, if you then remember, the universe is 13.7 billion years old. This is really early in time. You know, er, we've only been around for about a third of it. And this is almost right at the start. So this galaxy that we're seeing now, they actually form really backwards in time. So we can map out how the universe density has evolved. We can create these nice pictures of the cluster structures in our universe by staring back at it. So we see this kind of neural network-like structure. It's almost like staring into the neurons of a brain, almost. There are different features, I can tell you that, I can guarantee you that. And nothing except for the fact that microscopically they kind of look the same, uh, they're nothing in common. But what's interesting about this is that we then take supercomputers and try to simulate the evolution of the universe based on the pictures that we put together. And it turns out that we can only reproduce this kind of clustering information, this, this, this ganging of matter across the universe if we include subatomic particle like dark matter in the simulation. Hmm. Without it, we absolutely cannot reproduce what we see in our universe. There are other reasons why we believe that matter is particle in nature, uh, but I won't cover it today, but this is to me one of the most compelling evidence. So, so now we have a bit of a problem, because we ex we expect, if we go back to the scale of our universe, we expect that matter to be at the particle scale line, so down to this 10 to the minus 30, 30 meters range. But so far we've only seen evidence of it, in the, in the galactic scale. So that kind of reminded me of a famous quote from Einstein that he said that when he was really young, he looked at a compass and he realized that there was something underlying that compass that would always make the compass fall in Europe. And that's when he realized that if you have the right tools and you pay careful enough attention, you can catch something that is deeply hidden in the universe that you just don't see with your own eyes. Mm. And that's really what dark matter is. We know it's there. 
we see the evidence of our structures or universe. Uh, we just can't perceive it at a level, but it's around us. We know the density of our, our universe, of Earth as well. So it's this deeply hidden universe that we just can't quite perceive their own scale. So the next fundamental question is then, how do we cleverly design a new detector or a new experiment so that we could see what we can't perceive? In a way, like Einstein perceived the concept of, of electromagnetism from Earth by looking at the compass at point north. So how do we study the dark side of the universe? I remember asking this question to my, what, what then became my PhD advisor at Queens uh, when I was still an undergraduate. And his answer was quite starking. He, he said, oh, let me take a step back. He said, well, first, let me tell you what we know about that matter, because every time we want to design something, we want to think about how we measure something, we need to know what do we know, because we got to start somewhere. So we know that matter is photophobic, does not like to interact with light, likes to stay in the dark, sitting in a room, it's great. We know it's very antisocial. It really does not like to interact with regular matter, much so with itself, from what we can tell. It really does not like to interact with itself either. It's really, really antisocial, like emopunk level of antisocial. And then we know it's very heavy. It carries a lot of mass. The vast majority of mass in the universe is carried by dark matter. So this thing is heavy. It carries a ton of weight in our universe. And we know its density. We, we can map out the density. I'm not covering it today, but there are telescopes that we deploy, like the Gaia experiment, that carefully map out what we expect the density throughout our universe and uh, even in our own galaxy is. So how do you go and build a detector with only these four things you know? So I remember asking this again to my to, to what became my, my, my PhD advisor at Queens back when I was an undergraduate. And he said that it's very simple. If you want to understand the nature of the universe, you have to go two kilometers underground. Okay, maybe that's not that simple. So let me try to explain why. And keep in mind that, again, there are different ways to look for that matter, create that matter. This just happens to be one of them when I work on because it, I, I, that, that's what I've been drawn to. But the same imagine that every time that matter particle comes on them and communicates with a regular matter, with an instance of regular matter, every time their interactions occur in your detector, there's a hummingbird that sings. That seems like a pretty easy signal to spot. All you have to do is listen carefully for the little bird to sing, and then you can count it. And then how many times you hear that, count, that, that sing, you can count how many times that matter has been communicated with regular matter. Say we put an experiment on Earth that has ability to record sound to catch that thing bird. The problem is that if we do that, it would be like putting this little bird and yourself looking for it inside a gigantic stadium filled with people. It would be so noisy that you would not be able to spot or differentiate the sound of a hummingbird singing from all this loud brown fan being upset that their season is over two games into the season. They're just really loud, it's obnoxious, it's too difficult, it's impossible to hear the bird sing. Well, these obnoxious and loud people making very loud noises at football stadiums are equivalent to uh, our, our, our cosmic rays. Every time we sit on Earth and we build an experiment, even you now, we're showering, showered by lots of subatomic particles that are created by high energy gamma ray, uh, high energy uh, particles that are coming from anywhere in the cosmos. They reach Earth, they enter the atmosphere, and then they, they collide and communicate and exchange energies with elements and subatomic particles in our atmospheres and create more and more particles. We create what we call these this, this showers of particles. You can see here a representation of formation of one of those showers. And we know that we have so many energy, so many sources in the universe that makes these cosmic rays. So if I put a detector that just wants to listen to something here on Earth, there will be so many subatomic particles coming and having a chat with my experiment. It'd be impossible for me to hear that burst in. However, if I take that detector two kilometers out of the ground, it will be equivalent as is to do the same experiment, but now I have an absolutely empty stadium and nighttime. And now this tiny little bird that is singing every time that matter is interacting 
It's somewhere in your stadium. You don't know where it is. It could be at the very top. It could be in the locker room. It could be right in the middle of the field. But now there's nobody there making noise and the seat is asleep. You might actually have a chance to hear it if you're careful enough. So it's still an incredibly hard job to do, but it gives you a chance. And that is given by the fact that you put yourself with two kilometers of rock between you and the atmosphere. And these two kilometers of rock blocks all of those cosmogenic showers that we just see. So these rocks are just very good at absorbing all those subatomic particles that come in. But that matter, as we said before, doesn't like to interrupt with normal matter. So that matter goes through those two kilometers of rock like nothing, does not bother at all. So that's why we do this. But at Triumph, we don't have a, some, an underground laboratory, so we have to take a small trip. And this is really where some of the science starts to become national slash international. We need to start gathering expertise that we have in certain national laboratories. Like here, we have incredible expertise in developing detectors and understanding subatomic particles <laughs> interaction. And we have to gain up and start teaming up with other laboratories, like for instance, the, a laboratory that is in Southern Ontario called SNOLA, which is a state-of-the-art underground physics laboratory, meaning their experiment. This is the lab outside. So this is the main building on the outside, given by the amount of snow, I would say it's a beautiful August day in South Africa. Um, but their experiment is actually very two kilo, their laboratory is actually very two kilometers under this building in a rock. And we can combine the strength of Triumph, the strength of um, other institutes like the McDonald Institute and other uh, international facilities to come around and build experiments together. And Snollop is a great place to do that for that matter because we have those two kilometers of rocks to show us. <clears throat> the laboratory is actually rather unique. So this is the, this is this is buried inside an active go, uh, nickel mine. So when you when you go into the lab, you're dealing with mine people that are there to mine nickel and make money. So you have to walk across these massive tunnels that are built to kilometers underground. But once you get inside the laboratory, the laboratory is a class two thousand clean, meaning that there is one speck of dust for every well, two thousand centimeter cube. Uh, so this is cleaner than a surgery room. The entire laboratory is clean. We do that because dust creates a lot of noise in our experiments. We need to be clean to do that. But I have this nice starking difference between the two. It's, it's very, um, very interesting the first time we went to the laboratory. But, so here's the journey uh, the dark matter experiments have to do when they get to snow. Uh, you first get up here. And you take a shaft or, or an elevator that takes you two kilometers underground and drops you around this point of the mine. This is a picture of the mine itself, by the way. These are all the tunnels where the miners go. And so you take, you have your boots. And if you're unlucky, like this fellow, you carry some of parts of your experiment with you, so it's really heavy. And you have to walk two kilometers across this mine until you finally get to the laboratory entrance. And then, as we're seeing, it's not over because it's a clean room, so you just walk through two kilometers of dirty mine. So now you have to enter this process where you have to clean yourself and stake it until you're left with nothing but a uh, clean room environment clothing. Uh, even if for things, even if you have a beard, you have to have a beard net that covers you. Uh, you know, it's it's really intense. So we, we go from this this area here, we just go through all these stages of cleaning. We clean everything that comes in and every material that comes in and gets clean. And so there's this laboratory, which is inside this entire section of the mine. It's pepper spray with experiments there and there to look for that month. You might have heard of the snow experiment because you know they won a Nobel Prize in 2015 for this mm -hmm. effectively the nutrients of mass. But there are many other experiments that uh, Canada is playing a significant leading role, like super city events, big deep freezing sundry. Now, I actually want to take the deep freezing sundry example as just to show you one of the many dark matter experiments that we're building today and kind of what it looks like and what it takes to do for the next little bit. So that we can go from understanding what is this big puzzle, channeling down how we build one and actually showing you one of these things. So how do we build Deep Free 600? Well, I always like to think that the Empire built their own Death Star. So I always kind of wanted to build my own. So when this project came around, it was fantastic because we ended up building a factory of that star, which is fantastic. And, and precisely a hole in the size of the bottom 
much bigger than the whole of the Death Star, but I found it to be the most hilarious thing ever uh, that we, but accidentally by design, because we need to have a support there, we had a similar flaw system with a hole right in the middle of the big sphere. And it was also, this is the dark matter experiment. Uh, this is the deep freeze example of the dark matter experiment. What you see around here, we'll go through in a minute what's inside this thing. But what's on the outside is really the technology that we need to really push the envelope and develop in order to create those experiments and actually brought you some of these components here. So these are what we call photomotive light tubes. These are effectively reverse light bulbs. <clears throat> a normal light bulbs, we send electrical signal in it and we convert it into light. With these guys instead, we take single instances of light, single instances of light. Your light bulbs create maybe what, 10 to the 58 photons or instances of light per unit time. We take just a single of them and we convert it into an electrical signal that we can read out in our laboratory so we can count how much light there is in our experiments. They're extremely sensitive. The caveat though, you might think of that, wait, why don't we do this for energy? The caveat is that we need to provide a lot of power to these devices through high voltage in order to do that conversion. Uh, so I can pass it around if you guys want to have a look. Just be careful not to drop it. <laughs> uh, and I have a couple of more. These devices come in all sorts of shape and form. This is actually one of the devices that is on the deep that was on the deep uh, detector. It turned out to be not a great PMD, so we took it off and swapped it for another one. We have it here. Uh, but other experiments might use PMTs or put multiplier tubes. They are slightly different in shape, as you can think. Yeah, are they similar to the detectors they put in the um, to say uh, I'm uh, for the neutrino detector? Yes, absolutely. It's the same technology. What we're trying to look for is tiny flashes of light and you try to measure it with this. And we'll get back to how important this technology is in a minute. So this detector is surrounded by 255 of those PMDs. 255, and the reason why we have 255 PNDs around it is because inside this detector is a big sphere of acrylic that you can see down there with all spikes looking like a COVID looking thing. Um, <laughs> it's not, it's just acrylic. Uh, and inside that acrylic, we put argon in liquid state. Now, argon is just an element, so it's just an atomic structure. But what we like about argon is that it's got some chemical properties such that the flash of lights from a dark matter particle coming in and communicating with an argon atom, with an instance of argon, um, it's rather unique. So the, the, the amount of light generated by that interaction would be different than any other subatomical particle mm -hmm. that would come in your detector and do that. So thanks to those devices, we can sit there and peacefully and calmly for many years stare at this bath of liquid argon and look precisely for a very unique feature in light that a dark matter particle can come in and generate. And with that, we can confirm or not confirm what was the dark matter property that came in. Deep Resist Android has been running now for five years. Uh, this was my main PhD experiment. That's why I chose it. It's just very sentimental for me. This is what I worked on for my PhD. And they're just finishing up their data taking and uh, ready to decommission. Um, uh, incredibly successful experiment. Whole data has not been analyzed yet, but so far we haven't found yet an instance of dark matter. Question. So that middle picture is that is that tank filled with liquid argon? Uh, so this thing, this is actually this the this detector is the crystal. Yeah. Then it gets instrumented with this, and then it actually gets closed back inside this steel. So, so it's inside that sphere. Inside this, it's all of this. Yeah. Yeah, and we close it in there mostly because we want to make sure it's nice and light tight and sits in a nice closed environment. And that, that sphere is filled with liquid argon. This is filled with liquid argon and this sits inside here. Oh, okay, thank you. No, no yeah. problem. So this is a state of the art dark matter detector. Doesn't get different than that. Some experiments are bigger, some experiments are smaller, but the principle is always the same. You look for a dark matter instance to come in, flash light. Uh, or to create a new communication. Why, why, the, why the selection of argon? Yeah, argon, it turns out, has a rather unique chemical property, yeah. such that the timing structure of the light that is produced from interaction between subatomic particles and the argon itself um, differ for what we expect dark matter and regular matter, meaning that 
if we look at say things like electrons or gamma rays, the time structure of the of the life signal in argon is, is spanning over many milliseconds or quite a large chunk of time, relatively speaking, for those processes. Well, that matter, you have the light will come in a handful of nanoseconds. So quite sharp signal. And we can exploit that intrinsic property to, to isolate with that matter we live. Thank you. Uh, but before I conclude, I want to take a small side note to talk about, we focus quite a lot about fundamental science. We talked about fundamental questions like understanding the universe and all of that. But I want you to understand that in order to do those, all the advancement that we've seen from the NHC to the massive telescopes that we have, it requires technology development. A lot of the fundamental science are really pushing the boundaries. It turns out that in my field, in that matter, the tree of physics, where we pushed the boundary of technology really hard was on the photo multiplier tubes and the photo sensors. So these devices that are capable of measuring instances of life. And this today, those companies have been able to make all this advancement in this technology because we pushed it. And today, photo sensors are widely used in different sectors from aerospace, to biology, medicine, engineering. Self-driving cars are absolutely reliant on what we call lidars, which are photo sensors to really function and grow. And we have many applications, most of which are impacting your own daily life, like self-driving cars, medical imaging. If you ever had a PET scanner, you have used a photo sensor that effectively we all push the boundaries for. So sometimes when you push fundamental science, I shouldn't say sometimes, all the time when we push fundamental science, we're pushing the boundaries of technology. They usually spawns great things for humanity in general. So let me conclude. I hope that I convince you that we have extremely strong evidence that dark matter is sitting out there. We believe it to be particle in nature, and I show you why, but fundamentally, we don't know much about it other than it makes up for about 27% of the universe. This great chunk of the universe does not like to interact with light, very antisocial, very heavy, and we know how much we have across the universe. Um, I hopefully I showed you that despite knowing so little, despite knowing, however, that it makes a huge difference in our universe, we can still develop theory and detector and experiments to try and, and see this deeply hidden feature of our own universe. And hopefully I showed you that research and development in fundamental science drives benefits for the community at large. And I want to leave you with the discord that that matters for endless possibility. I like to tell the story that back in the 50s and 40s, when my, some of my old colleagues were looking for the so-called positron, which is an antiparticle of the electron, using this, this tiny instance of energy that makes up electricity. They were studying the idea that antimatter exists. They just wanted to show that for an electron, there is something that is just as equal for positive in charge instead of negative in charge. And that's when Howard and Anderson discovered finally the positron. They were driven by a fundamental question of understanding whether antimatter existed. They had no idea that that discovery enabled them the research on semiconductors and the development of things like chips and transistors 30, 40 years later, where we are today. So thanks to Cowan and Anderson and that discovery, we have these powerful cell phones that you guys have now. We can take incredible pictures and do pretty much anything. On. So when we do fundamental science, we probe fundamental questions, and we don't know what the, end, the possibilities are. It's up to us that as society to push it forward. But if you can think about how we change life with a simple discovery 60 years ago, for something that makes up a tiny fraction of the 5% of the universe. If we could unlock 30, this, the 27% of the universe, hopefully great things will come. And with that, I want to thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, yes, please. Well, here's a question to you. Um, there is a standard model of, you know, it seems to be well defined. You mentioned that under dark matter, dark energy, there's sort of particles that people are kind of 
put names to and from my any list of the four things about dark matter does it like the savvy social all that is that kind of the formation of the dark matter standard model that's coming i i think we're in a in a sense yes what you're saying is correct i think we're really far from starting to pin down individual instances of dark matter model we're still looking at large and so in, in a sense we're it feels like we're very far from doing that. But that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to then patch together what that picture and communication sets look like. And that's why I was saying there are different ways to look at the dark matter because different ways, different experiments and different technology might give you a different insight. It might be able to grow different components of that large picture, what is likely going to be a large picture of dark matter. Certain construction to that then. Once we get to that spot of having a dark matter standard model or something along those lines, how nervous are you trying to blend the standard model with the dark model? So I'm hoping that we'll be able to blend the standard model and the dark matter particles first before we even put together that picture. I, I, I personally, if you ask me at a, at a professional level, I do believe that there is a mixing communications between regular matter and dark matter. And the reason why I believe that is in short form is depends how you model the early stages of the universe. And I'm a firm believer of asymmetry in the early stages of the universe. What I said, like, it doesn't make much sense to you, but really what I'm saying is that um, it, it, is, it is likely that the two communicate with each other. And because of that communication channels, I'm hoping that we'll be able to discover an instance of dark matter quickly. So that portal will have to be the first off, the mm -hmm. first path to it. And then once we open that portal, we'll be able to then start pinpointing what each and every particle, subatomic structure in that dark matter world looks like. So I think the, the interaction with regular matter that would have to come first. And if that's not possible, it's just extra challenging, but not impossible to form that picture. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so think about it as a very, very tiny but very heavy Lego that you have in your set <laughs> that unfortunately you cannot find or see. So it's it's like that little Lego piece that you really want really hard because it puts together your your Lego structure really well, but you can't find it. But you know it's very important that it goes right there. Um, but, but I have more Lego blocks than <laughs> Yes, dark matter could also be a mega block. Good point. Never believe a single theory. Always try to open up your spend to multiple options. Mega blocks instead of Lego. Sounds great. Yeah. Is there anyone in the field disputing the initial binding of the um, relative measurements of amount of light and velocity? Yeah, um, so I, I have to, it's, everything's predicated. That's a really here. great question. And that's the question that scientists have been thinking about for the last 60, 70 years. So we actually found, uh, what I showed you about, for instance, with uh, Dr. Rubin's measurements of the uh, velocity curves. Uh, that's just an instance of just Andromeda galaxies. Ever since we have studied hundreds of, of spiral galaxies, we have seen similar halo structures in orbit. Uh, we have looked upon different galaxy clusters to reproduce sweepy measurements. Um, we have even looked into more complicated things like weak gravitational lensing, correcting all of those effects. Um, we have obviously gone much better at measuring the CMB. So I think by now, the general consensus among the strong, uh, among the community is that there's no question that the perception of dark matter that we see in our universe is there. Um, the difficulty is correlating it back to what we think its fundamental nature is that we're struggling. But if you ask astronomers, they will tell you we discovered dark matter many years ago. So it's not fun. Yes. Yeah, uh, it's interesting when I see 68% uh, of dark energy and then 27% of dark matter. So how how do you really know this is 27% or 68% that maybe not don't know much about either? Yes. Um, 
it is true that we do not know much about Eden. And now the distinction comes about one direction. The distinction comes around uh, the cosmic microwave background. Perfect. So it turns out that, as I, as I showed you, that this feature of this of the explosion that created the Big Bang can only really be modeled uh, with a unique set of parameters that describes the universe. And part of it is what's the composition of dark energy and what's the composition of dark matter and things like this. Uh, but because we measure the spectrum so well and because of its unique feature, even though we don't know what's fundamental nature, we can quantify how much dark energy is there because we know, for instance, that if we didn't have that much dark energy, this, this peak would be maybe much lower. As you can see here, here we're modeling, for instance, the uh, cosmological constants. If you change the constant, making it smaller or bigger, these peaks change size and structure. So there's this notion by looking at the explosion itself, we can tell what the explosion creates. It. What we can't tell is what is the fundamental properties of that, but how much of it is that we can quantify really carefully. And as I said, because of the precision that goes into this measurement, there's really a set unique of, of parameters that you can extract from this that tells you what the universe structures look like based on our knowledge of this. If there's things more complicated, if we happen to be a spawn of universe, then things get more complicated. We have no evidence to see that. Yeah. Oh, does dark matter have like a gravitational pull around like other visible matter? Yes, that is a fantastic question. And the answer is yes, it absolutely does. And in fact, because of his mass, because of our thin and how much mass it produces, it makes it provides gravitational effects that we can see very well. So, for instance, we if we look at objects that are really, really far in the galaxy and we place something in front of it, instead of seeing that object as a unit, we see that object kind of split a bit. So imagine like if I look at a sphere that is very far, if I have another sphere in front of it, I will see two small disks at the edge of it. And so it turns out that we're very good at seeing objects that are in front of us if they're made of matter, but not dark matter. But what we can see though is the smearing effects that the dark matter halo provides on some of those objects that are really far. So we can see objects that show diffraction of light because there's something heavy in front of them something that bends gra light in gravity. But there's nothing in front of it as far as we can see. So we know that there has to be dark matter there that is bending this light. So dark matter absolutely changes the, the gravitational structure of what's around us, and we see direct evidence of it. Yeah. Wait, also, does this like interact black holes? That's a very good question, and not one that I've asked myself that much, but luckily for us, we do have a black hole expert that <laughs> might, might matter to it. I don't think we have any theory yet to potential uh, cross talk, let's say, between the two, the two. But, you know, black holes seems to like to eat matter. Maybe, hopefully, they like to eat all forms of matter, not just regular matter. And if they do, maybe uh, that's also not a good reason of why the universe might evolve in a certain way after the other. But great question. Where is the explosion came from? That's a great question. And the answer is we absolutely don't know. <laughs> and the reason why, the reason why uh, is because we can't yet look backwards in time enough to get to the explosion itself. So we can see almost to the explosion point just after the explosion, but we haven't been able to see the explosion itself. Maybe, just maybe, once we're capable of doing that, we'll be able to answer your question. But at the moment, we just can't. We're not good enough yet. We're not good enough. We gotta get better. It's, yeah, in some of the models that I've seen uh, with dark matter in galaxies, they show it on the periphery, and that's where they assume that it is because the rotational rate of the galaxies uh, should be fast or slower, but because there's dark matter there, it keeps the all stable. Yeah. But it, that presupposes that dark matter remains separate from everything else. Isn't it possible that dark matter is amalgamated with or is contained in the crust of stars or planets 
where it's not directly visible, but the mass is out there. That's a good idea, not one that I think uh, is lost on colleagues, but to the reality is that especially dying stuff, we understand them fairly well. Yeah. In fact, if you go, if you walk, take a walk here, try and even build experiments here that we produce the conditions in the centers of the stars. So we know that to the best of our knowledge, we're not making that matter, we're making regular matter. So because we can model stars evolution so well, my tendency would be to say that there's very little room for that matter to be there or play a, a role. Where we do see that matter play a role, however, is in this large scale structure. And as you said, it looks like that matter was squished out of someone's galaxy. But it's not necessarily by random, randomness, right? There could be a process, you know, one example could be we just discussed. Maybe that matter is repulsive to black holes. And so what yeah. you see in spiral galaxies, black holes is accreting that matter, yeah. pushing. But if, if uh, dark matter is weakly interacting, then who's to say it isn't present within stars? I mean, like, because it, it would change. There are a lot of observable from stars that we can see, yeah. for which the measurements that we have would be severely impacted by the presence of dark matter in them, meaning some of their spectrum would be significantly different. Some of the processes, even think about, think back about the sun itself. We can model how neutrinos are produced in really high precision and measure them here on Earth. Uh, that matter presence would be very little room. We play sometimes in thinking, well, but if that matter the relation to the sun and things like this, there's very little room. The data shows very little room for evidence of that. Um, and now we can say quite confident. Thank you. Maybe one last question, maybe just wrap it up. Um, the paper will be here for a few minutes. Yeah. So you can come up and talk to Yes. Um, if I understand correctly for the people in the community who believe that dark matter is made up of some, some uh, alphabet of yeah. uh, subatomic, let's call it subatomic particles, is there an assumption that it was created by the Big Bang or? Yes, so the, the assumption that we all start, and that goes the same for regular math, is that just instance before the Big Bang, everything was in equilibrium. We start with the content of the universe plus whatever died away over the 13.7 billion years in equilibrium in a single state. That explosion kicked us out of equilibrium, meaning whatever was living there that appeared to be based on our theory, based on the model that we construct from the observation of the universe, appeared to be nicely in equilibrium until we kicked it off. So the same thing happened to dark matter. That matter was existing in an equilibrium state. And then the explosion happened. The universe cooled down to energy such that we couldn't re the universe could not produce new dark matter itself. And that's how we start with how much dark matter we have in the universe today. So yes, we start everything. Another reason why we believe in particle nature is that it, it kind of starts the same equilibrium prior to the Big Bang. And we can trace that really well, in the sense that to the same extent that we found galaxy, spiral galaxy that has dark matter tables, we can find, however rarely, we only found two instances of it, a spiral galaxy that follow perfect Newtonian's law. That's only possible if dark matter is particle in nature. And as the universe expands, there, are, there is a possibility, however unlikely, that a clump of regular matter either has already pushed out over dark matter or has spun and pushed and expanded without a content of dark matter in it just because of randomness of pulling everything in every direction at fast energy. So that's another, like I said, there are many reasons why we believe this particle in nature, but all evidence seems to point to similar to the regular standard, standard modern particles, similar evolutions and structures.